So um, up here on the screen right now is kind of a, well, it's a graphical abstract that we made for the paper that we recently submitted, which has a slightly different title than the title that's up there, and also a slightly different title than the seminar that I'm actually going to give today because I didn't take the trouble of expanding a previous seminar that I'd given, which was entitled um, Long-Term Variability in the Oxygen Minimum Zone and Calcite Saturation Horizons in the Northeast Pacific and Potential Impact on Seamount Communities. You can see from this title, um, my bias, which is that I'm an oceanographer and I'm working with benthic ecologists. So if you're here for the benthic ecology part, there we do get to that, but I'm gonna talk a lot more about oceanography and, uh, and the trends that we're seeing out there. And I think that's a really important story as well. But the paper, which um, this is the graphical abstract from, uh, has much more of the biological story in it. Um, and my, my co-authors on the paper and also for this presentation are Cherise Dupriez, who's a benthic ecologist, and Debbie Einstein. They both work at the Institute of Ocean Sciences with me. Um, Debbie's an ocean acidification expert, I guess our ocean acidification expert at the Institute of Ocean Sciences. And, um, and we rely on data from the DFO Seamounts program, which is led by Tammy Norgard, and then um, the Line P program, which is currently um, led by Marie Robert. So I'm going to start by backing up what's an oxygen minimum zone. So um, it's really important in my piece of the ocean because I study the Northeast Pacific or specifically the deep ocean off of British Columbia. Um, but maybe not everyone knows what it is. So uh, an oxygen minimum zone is a place in the ocean where the oxygen is at its lowest. Now we're talking subsurface here because surface oxygen is always high due to contact with the atmosphere. And this is a figure from a, I guess, getting old now paper from 2012 um, showing the minimum oxygen at any depth. So um, these are subsurface oxygen minimum zones. And if I flipped back here, this is actually what our oxygen minimum zone in the area of interest that I'm going to define it in a little bit. Um, this is what it looks like. This is the mean oxygen across it. And these are the seamount profiles of the seamounts that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, which is here. Hopefully you guys can see my cursor. I'm not really following the chat because it's hard to look at too many things at the same time. Um, but I suppose I could look down every once in a while and uh, if you had questions, I could maybe address them as we go. Um, no questions now. Uh, right, why are they important? Why are oxygen minimum zones important? Well, oxygen influences everything. I'm going to be talking mostly about the biological side of things um, later in the talk. Basically, it's essential for respiration, and so organisms can live in low oxygen environments, but they need to adapt. They have to have reduced or anaerobic metabolism, and many can't and have thresholds on the level of oxygen that they require. It's also important for chemistry or geochemistry. Um, in the absence of oxygen, a whole different suite of chemical reactions occur and um, get different rocks in oxygenated and non-oxygenated environments. How are they formed? Well, it's a combination of physics, so large-scale circulation and upwelling and biochemistry. So um, the water, at least I'm going to focus a bit more on the oxygen minimum zone that I'm talking about, which is in the Northeast Pacific. So the water is really old. It's like at the tail end of, of the um, global circulation, like the thermohaline circulation. So it takes about a thousand years to make loop. The, the water that's coming into our part of the ocean is about a thousand years old by most measures. Um, and then we're in an eastern boundary region, so the west coast of North America. So there's this old, deep, high nutrient water, which is being upwelled. And then that causes blooms at the surface, which supports rich fisheries. Great. But it also means that that biological material rains down and is consumed and the respiration, the consequent respiration depletes oxygen. And so you get this kind of thing where um, 
um, there's oxygen near the surface because influence of the atmosphere depleted near zero and then it, it goes up again um, as that biological influence dissipates and so that's what an oxygen minimum zone is and then the next thing is like are they changing right because we know they're affecting um, well that they're a feature of our ocean but if they're changing that could affect um, ecosystems is what I'm ultimately getting to but um, so they are expanding globally this is a another figure from a paper looking globally at oxygen minimum zones so or at least in changes in oxygen um, so it shows that there is a change in dissolved oxygen. Again, I'm focusing on this part of the world. It's decreasing. Um, and this is due to increased productivity, perhaps, or increased stratification, so reduced ventilation of the waters coming in. Right, and so now I'm going to focus on data from Station Papa, which is right here. This is where I am in Victoria. And you're not even on this map in Halifax, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, this is the oxygen. Um, so here we have it in milliliters per liters. It's over time. This is an older figure that was um, prepared by my colleagues. And like before I arrived <laughs> at the Institute of Ocean Sciences, and they've published on this. So Whitney et al. published in um, 2007 and showed the oxygen minimum zone, the upper boundary, that it shoaled, and I drew a line here, approximately with their uh, their shoaling rate uh, between 1956 and 2006, so over 50 years, it shoaled um, about 100 meters, so pretty fast. Um, yeah, and this is just showing as a function of depth and time. And so I've now updated that um, working with um, Patrick Cummins in a paper that we recently uh, published. I think maybe I have a little citation on the bottom there at some point, but it doesn't seem to be there now. Um, so that's basically I tried to reproduce that figure. There's their shoaling rate. Um, well, it, it, it shows a weaker trend and then there's their rate. Um, so what we found is if you add in another decade, there there is this long-term variability and it started, as you can maybe see here, um, started to go back down. So the mean rate went down. Um, and But the one thing that they didn't highlight and that we see, and it's still consistent, um, is this deepening of the lower boundary. And so that's, that's continuing and abated. There isn't really a change in the trend that we observed by adding 10 years more data, which kind of makes sense. Deeper stuff happens slower, less um, short-term variability, short-term in the sense of decadal. Uh, right. Okay, now shifting gears to talk about ocean acidification. So um, I'm gonna be talking mostly about the calcite saturation horizon and um, that might be surprising to some people because a lot of, a lot of work always um, uses the aragonite saturation horizon. So, um, right, just backing up, I'm going to say that, uh, I mean, they're both uh, calcium carbonate. So aragonite and calcite are forms of calcium carbonate. They're chemically identical, but the difference is in the crystal form and calcite is more stable. And that's one of the reasons why um, I'm going to talk about it because the aragonite saturation horizon is already very, very shallow. And so it's really the calcite saturation horizon that is, is intersecting our seamounts. And so that's why I'm focusing on the calcite saturation horizon, even though the, uh, when I get into the organisms, um, they have both aragonite and calcite. Um, so it is kind of all mixed up once you get into the biology. But you would think that calcite would be more important because they're closer to being at the um, at the, at the omega, which is the saturation state, um, which represents the thermodynamic potential for them to form or dissolve. So one is kind of the threshold as to whether or not the chemistry is pushing towards dissolution, which is for omega less than one, or um, or formation, which is, or, 
and it's much more complicated than that but that's my simplistic view on it and that's good enough for this talk <laughs> um, and generally we have um, the, the the surface waters have high, high omega and then the deep waters have low omega and um, yeah and then there's the saturation horizon and so here's just a little summary about why our why calcite and aragonite saturation horizons are shoaling because we're pumping all sorts of CO2 into the atmosphere and it's changing the chemistry of the ocean, essentially ocean acidification. And so, um, so overall, the omega values are going down, and that means that the horizons are, are shoaling because you still get this same gradient with depth. And there's some evidence that they're shoaling in our region, so Northeast Pacific again. So this is a, a, a line that's done, I think every 10 years or so, the P16 line. And so they, um, in Philly et al, 2012, showed that it was shoaling in the North Pacific this is aragonite, I believe. Yes, aragonite saturation horizon. And uh, jumping ahead, <laughs> our, our analysis shows the aragonite saturation horizon showing at a pretty much the same rate. Um, so we have much more resolved data, but we agree with them. But I'm going to talk mostly about the calcite saturation horizon, which they didn't. Um, so I can't compare. All right, so now to a little bit of geography. The area that I'm going to be talking about, so this is our steady region, which also happens to be the offshore Pacific area of interest, which is, um, it's in, what, it says by 2020, I think that maybe COVID might make this a bit delayed, I'm not sure exactly how that, um, how that's going to work out, but um, the process is underway to turn this into a um, marine protected area, which is huge. Uh, and it's protecting not just seamounts, um, I'm, oh great, I'm getting an email. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's also got, uh, hydrothermal vents, and it's also a really interesting region for pelagic re reasons, because it's in the sort of transition zone between where the, the currents are splitting, um, going north into the Gulf of Gulf of Alaska or the Alaskan Gyre and going south into the California current system. Um, so there's a number of reasons for protection. I'm going to focus on seamounts. Oh, here it just it popped in four times the size of Vancouver Island, so large, and would be Canada's largest MPA. Oh, and here I guess I'm listing some things that are related to why it would be protected, and then um, just showing that there's not much protected already. So this is, some of this is really just DFO speak. Uh, there's like these different bioregions that have been defined and, and um, not very much of it's protected right now. I think that's the point of this slide. Um, and also just to highlight that it, most of Canadian seamounts are actually in this area of interest. And so we have a lot of seamounts to look at and a lot of seamounts that could potentially be impacted by changes in the oxygen minimum zone or saturation horizons. Um, and just a little bit of background on seamounts, like what is a seamount? Um, it is basically a mound that's underwater and it has to come at least a thousand meters above their surrounding seafloor and it also can't intersect the ocean surface or also be an island. Um, it's usually an act, either active or a, pre, or a previously active volcano on the seafloor that never reached sea level, or an island that eroded back into the sea. Um, and they're important ecologically, so they're oasis of life um, and hotspots of biological diversity, tend to have high primary productivity, and uh, some of that has to do with the sort of circulation that the seamounts themselves create, sort of trap or um, concentrate low local productivity. Um, yeah, they basically are, oh, and yeah, they're also thought of 
being as a refuge for some species found on the continental slope. And I don't think I get to that so much in this talk, but I encourage you to eventually go read the paper that, that, we, that we published on it, and we talk a lot more about that in there. Um, as I said before, this talk kind of is uh, a bit more about the oceanography. Um, but I'm still telling you about seamounts for, for context. So um, these, this is the map, and it shows the seamount locations. Um, so there's a network. Now, this number is always changing. Every time they go out surveying, that, that number is probably out of date. I think it is. I think it's 47 now. They find new seamounts. Um, and so, oh, this is just a little bit of detail about what they, what they found on uh, the 2017 survey, which I'm, I'm going to be talking about data fr from that. Um, I'm not going to be talking about four unnamed seamounts, but they found four more unnamed seamounts in 2017. And they've been out again in 2018 and 2019, and that's why this number keeps changing. Uh, yeah, and this number doesn't seem to be changing a great deal because no one's finding very many in other parts of the Canadian oceans. Okay, so um, initially when I was thinking about the oxygen minimum zone and, and the seamounts, I came across this paper that I thought was a kind of really interesting way of getting into it without needing a whole bunch of biological data. So um, I'm just going to tell you a bit about this because I'm going to present some results um, based on this classification scheme. So it's a classification scheme that is biologically driven and has been shown to be um, to kind of create groupings of seamounts that are um, that match well with biological data. Uh, but most of the stuff that, that you use to classify the seamounts is not biological data. So things like um, summit depth and whether there's oxygen on it. There were, are a number of other ones as well. Um, proximity to other seamounts is important and um, primary productivity. Those are all important, but these seamounts are um, all proximate to each other, so there's no it's not something that helps to classify them in this region to ask whether they're proximate and they all have roughly the same productivity because they are proximate to each other as well. Um, so I'm going to just focus on the two most important to our group of seamounts, which is the summit depth and dissolved oxygen, and then just show you some pictures from different seamounts to show you how, how the seamounts that are classed in these different groups based on these criteria look um, very touchy-feely biology here right now but uh, so this is a uh, class one which has got a summit depth between 800 and 3,000 five no is that right 3,500 tripping over my tongue uh, so deep um, 800 comes roughly from the idea that the um, deal vertical migration, so the deep deep scattering layer that migrates, um, doesn't go a whole lot deeper than that. So it's not getting much delivery, sort of like daily or immediate delivery of um, food from the surface if it's deeper than that. Um, so you, you see that kind of uh, when you have oxygen. And when you don't, you see different, so there's still fish, <laughs> but now instead of brittle stars, um, we have sponges, and so uh, the, the, the lack of oxygen makes a difference. And then this is another class, which is um, closer to the surface. So one of the things I will mention is that these are four times zoomed out. Like, there's just a lot more stuff when you're closer to the surface, because there's a lot more food. And this is, uh, no, yeah, no oxygen and oxygen. So we see the sponges where there's a lot more sponges where there's no oxygen and um, a lot more, a ton of brittle stars, but also these beautiful branching corals where there's oxygen. Oh, and then there's a fifth, I threw in here, it's not actually in our area of interest, but there's a nearby, um, here, which I thought I was going to come in and 
Oh, there we go. Car. Uh, so it's a seamount that's not actually in the area of interest. It's outside of the Canadian um, EEZ. So it's uh, it's something that um, my colleague, co-author uh, Cherise, has been working on some stuff to protect Cobb Seamount and is interested in Cobb Seamount, so we just threw it in here um, because it represents a fifth class, because it is shallower. But I'm not going to show any um, images from that. Okay, so now line P. So we're getting more to the oceanography again. Um, so it goes right through this area of interest. So line P has been done for over 60 years now. And uh, and it goes right through the area of interest, and a whole bunch of sampling is done on there. But what's most relevant here is we have, obviously, uh, the physical measurements, temperature, salinity, um, oxygen. Um, that goes back to 1960. And then carbon, so the dissolved inorganic carbon, goes back to 1987. So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about. But there's a whole raft of other observations also made. And here's a figure that I made that kind of puts them together. You can see now this is the area of interest. These are the line P stations that are most relevant to it. Um, there's station Papa, which I had earlier um, reported the changes in the oxygen minimum zone at, and it has the longest record. So that was a weather station, and so it was sampled most consistently. Um, now I've highlighted also these two because the carbon measurements aren't done at every station. And so the, this, these are the sort of major stations where a lot of sampling is done. And so for the, for the carbon data, I'm primarily gonna be talking about these two stations. Uh, so uh, first I'm gonna talk about the oxygen though. And for oxygen, we have more data because we use the sensors on the CTD, so we have full, fully resolved, at least since 2000, and I can't remember exactly what, but we have the bottle samples going all the way back to 1960 as well. And so uh, I guess what, I'm, what I do is I do an annual mean of these 11 stations that are shown here, and then I also add P26 because it has a much longer record, and I found that there wasn't a big gradient, spatial gradient, so that I could put all the oxygen together. So what the consequence is, is that in the earlier part of the record, it's weighted a bit more offshore. And then in, in the more recent part of the record, last 20 years or so, um, it's, really, it's really this area because it's, I'm weighting across these stations. So if you've got 12 stations and 11 of them are here, you're more sort of spatially weighted towards this one in the recent time, but I wanted to be able to go back in a consistent way and look at trends. Just telling you the warts, if you're interested. So I make this average across the, the space, across space, and then I can make a plot like this as a function of depth and time. So we've got depth, time, and then the false color background is the dissolved oxygen in milliliters per liter. And what I found when I did this averaging, was that I don't actually have a trend at all in the, uh, in the top of the oxygen minimum zone. It's not significant. And in the bottom, there is. It's quite significant. So the oxygen minimum zone is expanding in our area of interest, uh, or our steady region, and, but it's mostly expanding on the bottom. And so a little bit of thinking about where that's coming from. So a uh, complicated plot. So this is um, what I've done is I've taken it apart, tried to take that trend apart. So I'm thinking about the change in oxygen, and that is what this, at a fixed depth. So that's what this black line here is. That's my actual observations. And uh, then I think about what the mean density at that depth is, and I go into density space, and I calculate the trend over time at that, in that, that density bin, which in this case is 27.04 kilograms per meter cube. So um, then I can look at sort of 
the change on an isopycnol. And then I also consider how that isopycnol is moving. So, because it, it is kind of surprising, we know that the Pacific Ocean is losing oxygen, but why is the top of the oxygen minimum zone therefore not moving? And the answer is because there's an equal and opposite driving of the isopycnols um, going down. Yes, they're, they're going down, and so therefore you've got a change in oxygen on the isopycnol, which you can see here, that's the, um, the blue, so it is decreasing. We see a decreasing trend on the isopycnols at all depths. Uh, but near, this is the, near the boundary of the oxygen minimum zone, the upper boundary of the oxygen minimum zone, we have um, the isopycnols are, are, are diving, essentially. And so it's um, sort of dragging that gradient down. And so you've got an equal and opposite, and it's balanced. Um, don't know why it's balanced. I'm not even sure what's causing the isopycnol smooth, but but we but we have observed that. So there are some changes in in, um, in circulation that are happening, and that that's driving the fact that the top is not changing. Um, and then I also picked out other depths. This one was the one I was most curious about because it was puzzling. Um, the near the the sort of absolute minimum of the oxygen minimum zone, so around thousand decibars uh, not surprisingly you see almost nothing from this uh, change due to isopycnal movement because you have no gradient right so the isopycnals can be moving as much as you want it's not going to change the oxygen so it, it matches perfectly with the um, change on the on the isopycnal and then at the bottom you see again not much change due to the circulation it's mostly due to changes on on the iceberg. Right. Um, so, coming back to that idea of the classification system, so I've, I'm putting some names of seamounts on here. Um, I'm going to talk more about these, uh, these four seamounts later because those are the four that we have data from. So I guess I could flip back to this map. Those are the ones that are labeled on here as well. Um, so if we just apply this, um, these changes, and then we just assume that our linear trends are going to continue into the future, which is, you know, not the best model, but nevertheless, it's, it's some kind of prediction that we can make. Um, these are the kinds of trends in seamount diversity that we see. So one of the things that I would like to point out is that, at least at the beginning here, this is actual... Data. Like, I'm not projecting the trends up to um, 2019, which is the last data that I used. Um, so it looks like we're already, we have already been losing roughly eight seamounts per decade, I think that was what I, does that make sense? Yeah, um, over the last while, and we'll continue, obviously, if the trends continue at the same rate, um, to lose class one seamounts, so that would be seamounts that have oxygen at their summit, um, but are deep. And they are changing into ones that don't have oxygen at their summit and are deep. Obviously their depth isn't changing. Uh, and then we don't have very many of these other ones, so it's pretty much remaining consistent. We have um, two seamounts, um, which I've named. Uh, actually, it's Delwood, uh, 18, uh, unnamed 16 and 18, and Union that we have data from, not, not Cobb, but Cobb is just in there because it's the only class 5 seamount. Um, so Union and Cobb, we just have one of each in those classes, and those ones aren't predicted to change. It's these deep ones that are changing. And so we're losing a class of seamount, and so that you know, if everything keeps going as it is, there won't be any class one seamounts left by 2200. So why would oxygen at the summit matter? Um, so this is just, again, sort of hand wavy stuff, but um, this is just showing the difference between union, which is a class four, so it has oxygen at the summit, 
and Delwood, which is a class three, it does not have oxygen at the summit, but, but at the same depth and on the same substrate. And we can see that there are differences, that it, there is much more abundant. Uh, um, so it seems like it matters that there's some kind of cascading effect of whether there's oxygen at the summit. So, uh, so we might be seeing some kind of ecological change due to the fact that all of these um, seamounts are switching from class one, right? Is it class one? Yes, class one to class two. All right, so just gonna have a quick look at what the time is to make sure I'm not going way too long. I'm good. Uh, so seamounts and uh, line P now moving on to ocean acidification. As I alluded to earlier, um, we really only have data from these two stations um, to, to represent the long-term trend in carbon over the area of interest. You can see one of them's just on the edge of it, the other one's right in the middle. Um, I found that there wasn't a whole lot of difference between them. There was actually quite a large spatial trend, but these two stations with the variability in the carbon data, I couldn't really distinguish a longitudinal um, difference between them. So I just combined the two of them together um, to represent the time series uh, for the area of interest. And yes, the there was a big study that was done, like a big sort of pan Pacific Ocean or North Pacific Ocean anyway, study that was done in, um, around 2009, where they came up with this adjustment table. So I applied all of the adjustments from that adjustment table to the earlier data to try and make them consistent across. Um, yeah, I guess the data quality wasn't as good back then, so, so it's good to apply these adjustments. And then also I should mention that although we do measure total alkalinity from the bottle samples, the data quality in the early years was really quite poor. So we've decided to use, because we really wanted to use those early data to look at, to maximize the amount of time we had to calculate trends. We um, used a total alkalinity salinity relationship that was tested extensively on the modern data in which we trust the total alkalinity more. And so we use that to project back. So then now I'm adding in the calcite saturation horizon. You can see that it is shallower than the top of the oxygen minimum zone. And we, we see a, um, a shoaling trend. So coming back to this, they don't actually include carbon or ocean acidification at all in this, but I just wanted to say, just sort of highlight that there really is only one um, seamount that's affected by this and its union, which we have data from, and I will show in a little bit. Um, and the thickness of the line, this isn't maybe the best, the most obvious thing, but the thickness of the line indicates whether or not at the summit there is, um, it's saturated. And so it crosses, it is going to cross very soon. The, um, the calcite saturation horizon is gonna shoal past the summit of, of unit. shortly. And just some nice pictures of corals on Union. So now I'm going to talk a bit more about the seamount, like the benthic uh, surveys that were done, the seamount data. And so basically there's uh, this drop camera called Boots, which I always forget what that stands for. Probably yeah, anyway, I won't try. Uh, so I'm going to talk about data just from one um, survey or one cruise of four different seamounts. So Union, Delwood, um, unnamed 16, and uh, unnamed 18. And they actually represent four of the classes. So um, just a little bit of stats on it. There were many, many records that were annotated. It took a lot of work from bunch of people to get it all counted. And they found, I think, 105 different taxa that were identified and annotated. They were resolved to the lowest taxonomic level possible. Um, it looks like they excluded organisms that were too small to be confidently resolved or dead. Um, 
And we kind of focused a bit on cold water corals and sponges because they're kind of habitat building species. Oh, one more thing. It was deemed suitable to merge the dive data from all of the different um, seamounts because the taxa were commonly depth distributed. Um, so it didn't seem to depend on the, which seamount you were on. Okay, so there were 105 taxa, and we decided that we wanted to focus on um, narrowly distributed taxa and also focus on um, habitat building taxa because we wanted to, because it was just too much to talk about 105 different taxa. So we parsed it down to nine. So, and these are the criteria that we use. So we wanted two mobile taxa with the narrowest depth distributions, and those ended up being the rockfish and the brittle stars. Um, so it, the brittle stars are in many of the different images, um, but here you can see a dense mat of them. Rockfish there. Um, I think you can see brittle stars there. Uh, anyhow, they're in multiple images. Uh, and this arrow is not pointing to a brittle star. So then we wanted to find, uh, now, now moving on to the sort of other part, which is wanting to look at habitat creating cold water corals or sponges. And then we wanted to look at the narrowest depth distributions, but in three different depth ranges. So we chose the above 800 meters, um, because that's sort of consistent with the, um, with the previous work that was suggesting 800 meters as an important threshold. And the two that came out from that is this bamboo coral here and this bubblegum coral. That's what's indicated with this arrow. And then the next depth range that we looked at was between 800 and 1,200 meters. And um, this is actually the, the lowest part of the oxygen minimum zone. So 800 meters was something that was chosen elsewhere for other reasons, but it actually corresponds quite well to if you wanted to define the oxygen minimum zone as being the part that's less than half a milliliter per liter, it would be sort of roughly 800 to 1200 meters. So it's sort of the core of the oxygen minimum zone. So we wanted to focus on some species in there. Again, the most narrowly distributed because these are the ones that are going to be most at risk from changes in horizons. So that would be these black corals and bugle sponges, and they found these. There's just such beautiful imagery of the bugle sponges. Uh, they found these beautiful fields of them down there, so it gives me pleasure to look at them. And then below 1,200 meters, uh, again, the most narrowly distributed. So this is the cup coral, which was, a, I think, a new species that was identified, and the undulated glass sponges. And I think it's a new species, so they were finding all sorts of new species as they were going out. And then just for comparison, we chose a ubiquitous taxon, so the feather star, because it was distributed all over the place, um, found throughout most, most apps. So this is what their distributions look like. So here I'm showing depth. Here it's indicating which... Uh, Seamount it was seen at Union, Delwood, and name 16, and name 18. Uh, and then these are the different taxa, so there's just nine, and this is what their distributions look like. So the mean, standard deviation, and then max min. And then these are the different zones that we were talking about. Um, and then just for reference, this is the locations of the calcite saturation horizon, the top and bottom of the oxygen minimum zone defined as one milliliter per liter. And then this is what we've seen over the record. This is the change that we've seen over 60 years. And then over the shorter um, carbon record, which is only 30 years, uh, that's the change that we've seen. It's gone up and that's gone down. And, it's, and that's how it intersects with the distribution of the organisms. So I'm now just going to tell kind of some stories about these different um, groups. The, I'm going to focus on the brittle star, the bugle sponge, and cup coral. So are the brittle stars going to be the climate change losers? So these are the most abundant of the indicator taxa. 
they have um, a magnesium carbonate structure, and so they're expected to be vulnerable to ocean acidification. And on in studies, negative ocean acidification impacts have been shown on on this species or similar species and um, they have been shown to be sensitive to hypoxia. So here what I've done is taken um, their depth range, which uh, is, is fully resolved, so with all the wiggles and everything, and I've weighted the oxygen at every, um, at every year by their, and then integrated that, and then I get a time series of oxygen at the depth range. Admittedly, only the modern depth range, the 2017 depth range, but I can look over that sort of modern depth range, how oxygen is changing and how carbon, or the um, calcite saturation state is changing. So I've done that for bugle spines on here as well. Um, so I'll just highlight the brittle star. Um, so the oxygen is decreasing, but the trend isn't significant. Uh, and then just in the, in the literature, there's, it's shown that they, uh, change their behavior in low oxygen. They, as my, as my colleague Debbie said, um, they let themselves be eaten. <laughs> there's some evidence that they, that they are less mobile and more vulnerable to predation. They let themselves be eaten in low oxygen, and it could lead to shifts in trophic interactions. Uh, now, the the trend is much more significant um, for the because they're closer to the surface. Their their depth is fairly shallow, their mean depth, and so um, we tended to find that the because there was that compensation happening closer to the surface, the oxygen trends were less significant and it just sort of, there was a transition where it was ocean acidification trends were more significant closer to the surface and as you went down, the oxygen trends became more significant. Um, so the decreasing trend is significant and, um, and they have this carbonate shell. So studies have shown um, negative impacts with decreased Omega, slowed arm regrowth, and high juvenile mortality. Kind of a sad story. Now, buccal sponges, um, they live in this, right in the lowest oxygen, and there's like these huge um, sort of forests of them. It's beautiful. Um, but are they going to be the climate change win winners as like this oxygen minimum zone expands? Or are they just going to take over? Um, so they don't have any calcium carbonate, so there's no worries there for ocean acidification. So they are presumed to be insensitive to ocean acidification. Although <clears throat> nothing is completely insensitive to it because anything that needs to breathe has to do some kind of exchange with the, with the water. So, um, but overall, compared to other things. And they're sensitive to but tolerant of low oxygen. Clearly tolerant because they live there. Um, so again, back to the same plot, I'm just going to highlight the, um, the buccal sponge depth range now. So oxygen is definitely decreasing, the trend is significant. And when I look at this, I'm like, I don't know if we can really project that too far out because you're going to hit zero eventually. But anyhow, um, can't go below zero. So um, a lot of the work on sponges like these, glass sponges, buccal sponges, has been in shallower places. So um, places where there is a lot more oxygen, so they, they have been thought to be rare for oxygen less than 1.4, but we are clearly observing them in, in lower oxygen water. Um, so I'm not sure that totally applies. Um, also, they've been observed to change behavior by reducing filtering rates in low oxygen water, so they could survive long periods of low oxygen if the currents are strong enough, because they can use the ambient current for feeding. Uh, there wasn't a trend, so they should be less affected. I think I've mentioned this already. Oh, the only thing that I've added here is just that uh, that they have ancestors that lived through all sorts of different kinds of conditions in the past, so they're, they're survivors. Um, the one thing that 
makes me nervous about calling them or predicting that they would be climate change win winners is just that they require the silicic acid. And we really have no idea what the climate change effect on the silica cycle would be. And they're also sensitive to temperature change, which may be observed. All right, so these are these cup corals. Um, although they are a, a, a new species, they are related to some well-known species. So that's why we feel like we could kind of make some predictions as to whether or not they should be um, doing well under different conditions. But obviously they're, um, well, as the, as the title on this slide said, suggests they're tougher than we thought um because when we just started looking into it we we're like oh they shouldn't actually be at that depth they shouldn't be surviving um because they're aragonitic and so they should be sensitive to ocean acidification and they're found very deep where the saturation levels are quite low um their skeletons are partially exposed um so one of the things that protects organisms like we are finding all of these corals in these undersaturated waters um but they have these sort of fleshy um, coatings that protect the skeleton from dissolution. And these seem not to have it. The, the hold pests are, are exposed. So again, a puzzle. Um, so they should be sensitive to mineral saturation states because of the both parts that they are made of this weaker or more prone to dissolution aragonite have partially exposed skeletons. So they really should be sensitive, but we found them in very low. Also, they're expected to be sensitive to oxygen. So some studies on similar species have found mortalities for oxygen less than 1.5 milliliter per liter, and we're definitely seeing them at lower oxygen. And they're sensitive to temperature change, which isn't something we really thought that much about in this study. Um, anyhow, they should already be working really hard to survive in present day conditions. And maybe that explains why we found these like tiny lone individuals rather than branching colonies that have been found of related species like Lophelia pertessa. So now I'm going to summarize. Hopefully I haven't gone over. No, it looks I'm good on time. Excellent. Um, so basic message here is that the oxygen minimum zone is continuing to expand in the Northeast Pacific. This has been observed previously. So we've had a few refinements on that, like that, uh, that we're not seeing the upper bound really changing. It's mostly in the lower bound. Um, if the trends continue by uh, 2200, the, this offshore Pacific area of interest, our study region or the, the new, hopefully new marine protected area will have lost one class of seamount. So more seamounts will have hypoxic conditions at the summit. And it's mostly these deeper seamounts that are impacted. And this could lead to um, a reduction in the diversity of ecosystems in the MPA. Now we found species, like similar species, on all of the different seamounts, but um, not necessarily at the same densities, right? So the idea is that if you if you lose sort of a class of seamount, you might be losing the seed population for other seamounts, and so that it could it could be significant to lose them, despite the fact that we have lots of seamounts and and similar organisms on them. And yeah, it appears that the hypoxia at the summit matters, that it cascades down, affecting the entire seamount ecosystem. So analysis of the dive camera data shows there are animals with narrow range distributions that may be impacted by the, the, the changes in the horizon depths. And then the likely winners would be things like bugle sponges because the areas that they occupy are expanding. And then things like brittle stars, corals, even the fish, um, the rockfish. Uh, I didn't focus on that here, but in the paper we talk a lot more about that in it. And it looks like we may have already even um, observed. A, there's some evidence that they may have observed some extirpation, I think, from um, one of the seamounts, which I'm forgetting right now, one of the shallower seamounts because they used to be fished there and they haven't been observed in any of the surveys they've done over the last three years. Um, so one type of, yeah, the rockfish, sorry. I'm babbling on. I should just go to the questions. So anyway, even the seamounts in the oxygen minimum zone are losing habitat with oxygen greater than 0.3 milliliter per liter. And thanks for listening. So you can ask me questions on the chat. 
which I will read out and then answer, or you can just email me. The silence. <laughs> oh, a question from Davy Bear. What is the process that is responsible for the upper picnocline to deepen if the surface is warming? The upper picnocline to deepen. Well, we think it has to do with, what was it that we wrote about that? Um, so it has to do with circulation changes. And we, I think it may have something to do with um, what's happening in the Western Pacific, because at the depths that we're talking about, which is below the main, the permanent picnic line. So, um, so we actually don't see a change in the picnic line depth. So the main permanent picnic line is staying where it is. We see that the summers are warmer and there's stronger stratification uh, at the, in the surface, like the seasonal stratification is getting stronger. So yes, there is an overall warming trend, um, but the, the permanent picnic line is, is not moving. It's below that, that it's moving. And a lot of that water is coming from the Western Pacific, so it's probably changes in the water properties over there that's making those picnic clients uh, migrate. I hope that answers the question sufficiently. Could any of the changes we've observed affect acoustic propagation? Could the changes affect acoustic propagation? So most significant would be temperature, I would think, <laughs> um, on sound speed anyway. So we don't see huge changes in temperature, um, certainly the seasonal, like very close to the surface, we see warmer conditions um, above the picnic line largely, so above 150 meters, because that's where our permanent picnic line is in this region. Uh, there, it's a lot more variable, and yeah, there's probably changes to acoustic propagation, but down deep we don't see huge trends like that I think would be significant for acoustic propagation that um, I'm not really sure how the, ch the carbon changes would affect it. I think there has been some research on that, but I'm not really an expert on that, sorry. My, my guess is no, that's my instinct for deeper anyway. <laughs> 